On this episode of Remington's Inside the Industry, I'm going to be joined by one of the African safari industry's most recognizable personalities, professional hunter Mark Haldane. Mark is widely recognized in serious safari circles for his talent and bush skills while guiding international hunters, but he's equally well known as one of the leading wildlife conservationists in the country of Mozambique. Mark's company, Zambezi Delta Safaris, is one of the best examples of the phrase so often used by my friends at the Dallas Safari Club, conservation through hunting. You're going to enjoy today's guest, professional hunter, Mark Haldane. This podcast is brought to you by Remington Firearms. For more information on the new era of Remington, visit our site at remarms.com. Mark. Mark Haldane, great to see you again. Thanks Thank for joining us. Thank you so us. much, Ken. Uh, and congratulations are in order. You won the Outfitter of the Year last, yesterday, last night. Well, Ken, thank you. I had a lot of help. I have a good team behind me. It's easy to look good when you've got good people taking care of you. Yeah, but you but you took the trophy and the award and the I money. Did, and but on behalf of the team. <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I, I think you should be, and I'm sure you are uh, really proud of that. It's It's quite a... I think it's a real honor. Congratulations. I think it's fantastic. Thank you, Ken. It is. We were all very honored to receive it. Kind of pisses me off that I that I was not able to make a hunt with you and another group recently. Um, I guess that was really a good hunt. Everybody said they had a lot of fun. We had an absolute ball. And with Fallon up there, you know, there's never a dull moment. <laughs> That's true. But some of his guys, like, uh, you know, F, just he was over the top. He's hooked now. He'll be coming to Africa every time he's got a couple of pennies in his pocket. I'm not entirely sure Amber will let him get away with that for too long. <laughs> um, that's the carpet client we need. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> One that's willing to go in debt to come for a visit. That's it. Yeah, we like addiction. <laughs> and then uh, uh, who else was there? Uh, uh, Mox, Paul Moxley. Paul Moxley was there too. He had a yeah. great time. He took a pretty substantial bag. That's what I understand. <laughs> he sure did. <laughs> I understand that that his uh, his bag was uh, was much greater than he anticipated from the beginning. It was indeed. He said he's looking. He's short of wall space. Yeah, but it, I, he'll sort that out. I think he will. You know. Actually, he sent me a, a. Besides sending me pictures while he was there, he sent me. A, I think he sent me five pounds of shrimp. A bunch of nil guy. That's a good friend. And a recipe how to how to <clears throat> do the shrimp. He didn't have any <laughs> any faith in your in your cooking abilities. No, he, no, of course not, and I I can appreciate that. Uh, one of the things that um, the DSC is one of the things that that Ken Darcy personally is is uh, really big on on conservation and anti poaching. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your efforts in in Africa towards that. Well, Ken, I'll try and tell you the short version of a very long story. Oh, we got a lot of time here, don't we? Okay. We're not in a big okay. hurry. Ken, um, <clears throat> I, went to, I first went to Mozambique in 1994, and uh, <clears throat> the area that Katali 11, where I'm today, same area that I hunted, it's a beautiful area. I mean, just absolutely stunning. But the wildlife had been decimated uh, during the war. Is that the area in Mozambique? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The same area I'm in today in right. Mozambique. It had little fragments of pockets of game here or there. Um, the owner of the block <clears throat> had pretty much burnt out, and uh, he was very quick to hand the reins over to me. Um, we started off with a very basic anti-poaching program, and the game responded. And the mere fact by having hunters and a presence there also bolstered, uh, bolstered the whole system. Um, Unbeknown to me, the uh, area we had we had uh, chosen or chose us was an absolute ideal habitat. And there's a well-known phenomenon that when game is totally plundered, the little pockets of game that remain naturally gravitate back towards the area of best protection and best habitat. And that just happened to be our area. So apart from our protection, these little pockets all gravitated back. And uh, our claim to fame is we started off with about 1,200 buffalo in the delta. And uh, today we had just shy of 24,000. 
So they've responded incredibly well. Virtually every single species we have there has followed along with it. And as the animals have come back, um, so is the threat from poaching because it makes sense you'd rather poach in a game-rich area than an area that's depleted. So we've had to up our game as well. But with the extra revenue from the game, we were able to build it. And in more recent years, we had fantastic uh, support and partnership from, from DSC and, and, and the foundation. And that really was what took us to the next level. Today, we've probably got one of the most game-rich areas in wild, unfenced Africa. Uh, there are just thousands of animals e everywhere. Um, I think w it would be wrong not to add that in rural Africa, anti-poaching alone will never, ever be the solution, uh, the long-term solution. You'll, you'll achieve lots in the short term. But in the long term, you've got to change the hearts and minds of your local villagers and make them uh, feel some sort of benefit, direct solid benefit, and some sort of, of ownership. So we've, uh, we, we uh, took some time to build that relationship. And some of our more successful projects with them is the school, um, the clinic. Uh, we have a community rice farm. Um, we have uh, uh, fresh water, water wells that we've sunk for them. And uh, probably the most uh, pleasing one for them on the short term is, is the fresh meat uh, distribution. Last year we did 34 tons of fresh meat. So <clears throat> the one thing I can say... But, but just a second, trophy mm. enders just kill something and chop the head off. <laughs> the meat's never used, is it? <laughs> Ken, that is such a, a misguided belief out there. I so know it. I tell you one thing, I, I don't have a single client that I can think of who doesn't take great joy and pride in taking the morning off from hunting and going to do a village meat drop. It's a humbling experience and it's, it's a happy experience. Everyone's in a line there. We weigh the meat. The, the headman comes out and signs for it and every person is allocated a piece of meat. And one thing I can honestly say with an open conscience in, is in our block, Katali 11, it's about half a million acres. We have about 1,200 people on the fringe of our area and not a single one of those people ever go to bed hungry. And the reason is, is because of the involvement of trophy hunting. You know, we, we, employ, we employ 56 full-time people. We employ up to 200 part-time people and uh, all the benefits, the farming, the meat distribution. I didn't uh, mention the community fishing program. Uh, so, every, so food is not an issue in our area. You don't need to poach for subsistence. Look, we have the odd scallywag that does it commercially, but my anti-poaching unit takes pretty good care of them. And I think very importantly, Ken, is that support that we have had and still have from Dallas Safari Club, the foundation, and even their members. You know, the guys will come and hunt with us and at the end of the safari say, well, what does it cost to run your fast reaction motorbike team for a month? I give them the figure and out comes the checkbook. Mm. And uh, it's just fantastic to work with people like that that put so much back into the conservation and how to conserve what they love so much. But Mark, you, but you, you, mentioned something that I think is really, really important. If you don't, if you don't bring the community into something, you'll, you'll never have success. It's one of the things, you know, look, let's even discuss the drugs, for instance, if you will. Yes. You know, if you look at drugs in some of these, these countries, if a farmer needs to feed his family and he can't do it with normal crops, yeah. and somebody comes along and says, look, if you grow this, you can take care of your family. What is that person going to do? Absolutely, Ken. We do the same thing if we are faced with that 100 percent every time. Yeah. So once the once the community gets involved, and they can they can feed themselves, they make a living. You, you get so much support that you can't help but succeed. You know, it's well, what's changed um, uh, drastically is in the early days, we ran the anti poaching with a fist of iron. Anyone we caught, we arrested. We took them, we charged them, and the relationship between us wasn't great. Today, there's smiles, there's laughter. 
probably 80% of the arrests we make with the anti-poaching unit are from tip-offs from our very community, you know. They realize they've got to work with us. They like working with us. Right. They're happy working with us. Makes life a lot easier. You know, it's interesting because the poaching in North America, you know, terrible thing. People get reported. They get arrested. And they go in front of the courts often. I'm not saying all the time. And depending on where. <clears throat> well, I was just trying to feed my family. Okay, you can, you can go home now. Thank you. We understand. Yeah. Uh, and I think that a lot of them just, and I'm talking about the court system, just doesn't understand the seriousness of poaching. Yes. Uh, you know, anybody can work today in this country. Absolutely. You know, yeah. just, and in particular, you, you come from another country. When you come here, do you look around and say, boy, these poor people? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. No, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I take uh, your point, and it's very valid. You know. Um, how long have you been doing this? Uh, this is uh, 20, 22 is my 38th year of guarding, but I've been in Mozambique 27 years now. So you've been there when I was still in diapers, I guess. No, I guess that's probably <laughs> not true. You're not, not, you're not, not supposed quite, to laugh yeah, that hard. Quite. <laughs> <laughs> so what does the future bring for you? Um, <clears throat> Ken, it's always an interesting one because you've got to keep moving. You can't stand still else you're going to Correct. Sink. So from an anti-poaching front, uh, continual training, making my unit more professional, keeps their morale up, um, moving with the times, continually adapting to what the poachers adapt to, which they sure to adapt to all the time. Um, formal training is very important, which we'll do or we, we do all the time. Um, on the community side, we want to keep moving forward. We've started a beekeeping project, which will probably become pretty big. Um, uh, beekeeping. That's beekeeping. Brilliant. So each family will have, we'll give them the boxes to look after and manage, and we'll do the harvesting, and they paid for the honey. And it appears if we give them about 20 boxes, they'll get about six months' worth of minimum wage on average from the honey crop. And the exciting thing for us about that, it's a project that will become self-funding. It's not one we keep on having to go out and ask for right. someone to to uh, to sponsor. Within a couple of years, it'll become self-funding. It appears that our honey is of one of the highest grades in the world, uh, totally organic, mixed, multi-flora. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna ride that wave as hard as we can and get top dollar for it. So that's one of our big projects coming up. And honey, honey is something in North America that is becoming harder and harder it, to. It is. To it get. is indeed. Yeah. Um, on our anti-poaching, conservation, and community footprint, we've, we're quite happy with where we are in 11. Of course, we're going to keep growing, including the honey, but we are going to slow, slowly uh, spread into our neighboring areas with their permission um, and cooperate with them and try and get the blueprint that's worked so well for us in 11 to work in the neighboring areas. Uh, you know, after all, we can't just look at one little block as your own little kingdom. You mean one little 500,000? It is. In the big picture, it's small. <laughs> uh, you know, it's pretty big when you're there hunting, for sure. But ultimately, we need to look at one ecosystem and try to save the whole ecosystem. So we'll secure it, um, which we've got some exciting plans in the foot to do that, uh, which I'm excited about. You know, Mark, it's amazing to me that in talking about this, that and again, I bring this up multiple times that people, non hunters, they just don't understand. They just don't get what people like you and, and the hunting community is doing for the habitat, for the wildlife, and for the human beings. They just don't get it. Um, and I don't know if they ever will. Maybe they just dislike hunters so much they'll never open their ears and be willing to listen to somebody like you talk. Well, it, it is an interesting thing, and I've got a few opinions on, on it. And uh, the one is I think you've got those people that are pro-hunting, which we don't need to convert. Right. You have that bunch sitting in the middle, which is probably the majority. They don't really sway one way or the other. And then you've got those that are vehemently opposed. And I think that um, as hunting, as hunters, hunting organizations, hunting outfits – 
um, and as hunters at grassroots level, we have to clean up our act. And we don't need all the negative p publicity because one bad act um, sorts out 100 good acts. Um, and I think we need to take more care of what we do out there and how we publicize it, what we do with social media. And uh, I think we'll win a lot of those people over by pure common sense. Um, the stories from Tanzania, when the lion exports were stopped, how many areas failed and went back to pastoral grazing grounds and agriculture, ultimately millions of acres of prime lion habitat was lost. And that's pretty easy to, to, you know, to do the sums on. So I think we've got to start to use those figures to our advantage and publicise them and uh, be mature about what we post and how we post and sensitive to folks that are not necessarily hunters but who are prepared to listen to us. But don't you think, Mark, that the vast majority of conscientious hunters already do all those things? Yes, I do, 100%. So now you just get those one or two rogue people. That's it. That's in, it. But frankly, there's almost nothing that we as a, a hunting community can do to prevent them, especially with social media today. No, it is difficult. You've got a point. It's, it's a difficult task. But, Ken, another thing is, is I think we don't um, actively publicize enough of the good deeds that hunters, hunting organizations, industry within hunting are doing. You know, we, we kind of do it and just go along our own way, but we need to, we need to get it out there so people realize what's going on. I, I actually agree with you. I remember at SHOT Show two years ago, I think maybe three years ago, I had, I was invited to speak to a few different groups, uh, just some, just private meetings. And one of the things that I said to each of them, I said, I frankly think that the hunting industry has done a disservice to themselves, calling it a trophy hunting. Hit the nail on the head. You know, because people just think that if you're a trophy hunter, you kill something, you take the, the head, and that's it. That's it. There's a misconception about it. Absolutely. Yeah. But to me, the whole industry has to change that. They do. You know, and I don't know, I don't even know if you, how you possibly get away from the trophy hunting. Sure, we all like to take mature animals and, you know, big heads, let's face it. But I think there's definitely a bit of a change of heart. Um, you take the Cape Buffalo, you know, 40 inch spread was always the magical number. But I honestly hear more people saying, I say, what kind of buffalo would you like to take? What, what, what would your ideal trophy be? Again, I've used the wrong word again. But what would your ideal buffalo you'd like to harvest be? And most of them say nowadays, I'd like a big boss and an old boy. Yep. And that's more important. It really, really is. Right, because the other thing that people, non-hunters, have no idea about is the death that these animals have in the wild. Mm. Uh, give me a shot through the heart any day. I'll absolutely. It. Couldn't agree more with you. <laughs> because they're absolutely brutal. And I don't care if it's in Africa or it's locally here. You know, if you get one of these big old uh, bull elks that uh, that dies, you know, the, the wolves get them. They tear strip by strip by strip off them. It could be hours before they're mm. dead. And people just don't get that. Yeah. Uh, so, no, I, I'm glad that you you kind of agree with that or Absolutely. that I agree with you because yeah. I really think that that's but I don't know how to get around it and I think maybe it's generational you know because a lot of the people today that that certainly can afford to go to Africa have people that have grown up in the the yes. trophy hunting world no you're right you know you're so right. maybe the next generation and if we do the right things maybe that changes you talked about the buffalo um, I know that, that your concession has got swamps yes, and, and um, you know, fields. So it's a completely different hunt for a Cape buffalo in those areas. Ken, it is a different experience. Um, we have, uh, in our half a million acres, approximately 150,000 of it is swamp. And that's where our big herds of buffalo concentrate. Um, the funny thing is, over the last two years, we've kind of just about reached the tipping point on the buffalo numbers. 
and we are having more and more pushed out to the fringes of the swamp and onto the floodplain. But we also are quite fortunate we have a very good population of buffalo that live in the savannah. Exactly the same buffalo, just some have chosen to live in the savannah and some live in the swamp. And they don't tend to cross over. Mm. We've collared some, the scientists have put some on, hoping to find some sort of migration, nothing. But uh, so yes, we have in both areas and our swamp buffalo hunting is very different to the classical buffalo hunt that everyone knows, you know, when you're tracking through the bush. Not everybody on this knows. This so, is true. You know, so maybe you can explain a little bit. Well, your old classical buffalo hunt is driving out in the morning, picking up typically where the herd of buffalo have crossed the road, and after checking the wind and how fresh the tracks are, off you go with your tracker, and you track that herd of buffalo down, and if you're able to approach close enough and look through the herd, with a bit of luck, you might find a suitable specimen. Or it may be a couple of old bulls together. That's the old original one that most buffalo hunters know. In the Zambezi Delta, we have huge herds, up to 1,000, 1,500 buffalo in a herd, and they live out in the swamps. It's not all water everywhere, but there's a, a spider web of channels and papyrus, and in between there's some dry land, and these big herds live out there. They virtually never see a, a shade tree their entire life. There's not a tree out there. But the buffalo have absolutely thrived out there. And as I said earlier on, we are now looking at a 24,000 buffalo in that delta, relatively small area. That's unbelievable. Because you said earlier that when you took over, there was like 2,000? Yeah, 1,200. 1,200? 1, yeah. And today you've got 25,000. Yeah. And hunting's just terrible, isn't it? It's it just, is, isn't it? Know, it's yeah. just, it just destroys everything. Yeah. yeah. That's unbelievable over that period of time. So that's just in the Delta. What about on the Savannah? In, in the Savannah, they're a little bit harder to count. Um, and I can only uh, mention my block because I have the numbers for that. But we have about another 2,000 buffalo that live in the Savannah area. So when people come and they want, they want the old one or the big one, where do you take them? To you know, the Delta or the Savannah? You typically have a much bigger selection in the Delta purely because of the numbers. But uh, every, and every now and then we'll pull an absolute snotter out of the, out of the Savannah <laughs> as well. So you never quite know. So, so what about hunting in the, in the swamp? I have never done it. I spent a fair amount of time working on oil crews up in northern Canada and muskeg and terrible, terrible stuff. It was never fun to slog around in, in knee-deep muskeg. I can imagine the delta is not that much different. So one of the nice things about the delta is the water's warm. But, uh, it was know, full of other things too, isn't it? There are, a few, there are a few things that'll give you a nip out there. <laughs> right. But what we use is we use um, a vehicle called a Huglands BV-206. It's an articulated amphibious vehicle uh, that can float and uh, it's not unstoppable. They do get stuck every now and then, but they pretty much will get through everything we've got out there. Um, the turning point for us is that by using them, we are able to extract 100% of the meat. And when you go out there and you're shooting one or two buffalo, I can't tell you how important it is to bring every single last piece yeah. of that meat out. And that is the cornerstone of our conservation and uh, our community by them getting all the meat from everything we take. Um, so yeah, that's what we use. When you get out there, believe it or not, you need a good pair of gloves and a pair of knee pads because you're going to crawl too. So you may see the herd of buffalo out there, um, possibly at a mile. It's flat as a pancake, so you won't actually see the buffalo, but you'll see the white cattle egrets following them. Oh, okay. As the buffalo move, these clouds of cattle egrets lift off and land, and you know with 100% right. certainty those are buffalo out there. So that's when you normally stop, and that's when the slog starts. So you'll normally have a river or two to, to cross. They're not normally too deep, normally waist deep, pretty muddy, and through you go. And then you're very often on dry ground. And one of your big problems is not so much getting through the mud, it's getting close enough to the herd with no cover, because the grass gets pretty short, particularly in the late season. So inevitably, you're on all, all fours, 
and a 300 yard crawl is not a, not not unusual um no, i'm not exactly sure i could do a 300 yard crawl uh, you probably my could knee, if the my, buffalo my, were watching you yeah possibly my knees aren't in that good of shape <laughs> <laughs> that's why you need the knee pads yes exactly yeah, yeah. well I, I saw some of the photographs from from the fallon crew that was there um, you know, and one of those articulated up in the Arctic, we used to call them nodwells. I think they're, yes. they've, they've changed. They're different, but, um, you know, F had a couple of pictures of one that got stuck more than once. Yes, that's you exactly know. right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a, a new driver. <laughs> yeah, what happened is they had a shaft break between the front and the oh. back and they were unaware of it. It's oh, scripted. Okay. So the back wasn't driving the front. So that was the issue. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, look, there's been a big change in, in, in the international and the national hunting, but international, which I think COVID obviously has a big, has had a big effect on you. How's that changed the safari business in the last couple of years for you and other, you know, and other outfitters in Africa? Um, Ken, uh, the year before last was virtually non-existent. We shot about 30% of our quota. And that was right at the end of the year. Um, and I had a couple of really good old clients who just came out just to save the day. And they certainly did. They kept our, our heads above water. Um, strangely enough, last year, uh, there were no shows, as you know, no, no DSC. Um, I came out in April um, when I met you at Fallon's Ranch. It was one of the best marketing trips I've, I've ever done. And consequently, we had an absolutely amazing season. But it was a lot of our old clients who just knew they had to come out and hunt to help us, help our conservation. So we had a good season. But what we have seen is there's so much uncertainty in the world that instead of having your seasons booked three years out, you know, you now booked you know, eight months out, eight months to a year out, um, which is a little bit unsettling for an outfitter so so where you used to be booked two to three years now yeah. you're only booked a year out. that's oh, it really yeah yeah i mean we have we have hunts for 2023 probably you know less than half the season really is spoken for where five years ago that certainly wasn't the case right. and what uh, about 2022 uh, 2022 we've got a good season yeah most of my colleagues say the same. 2022 is great. 2023 is still a little quiet. So I think, you know, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong here. I think what's maybe happened is uh, I think a lot of outfitters, when people were booked for 2020 and they lost 2020, some probably refunded. A yeah. lot of the people rolled them over. Yes. And then challenges in 2021, maybe some of them ended up rolling again. Yes. You know, um, so I've heard that a lot of people are really solid for 2022, but I think a large portion of that has probably been rolling from 2020 and 2021. Um, I believe you're probably right with most guys. Um, we've rolled very little over from 2020 to 2022. We did most of it last year. Right. So we've got a pretty fresh season. I, I think there's... I'm not going to say there's a lot of African outfitters, but I, I suspect there's a fair number of it. When they got the deposit, they spent the deposit. Sadly, that's true. Yeah, right. And now people go, well, I don't want to roll it over. Well, sorry. What do we do now? We, yeah. you know, we, we haven't got the funds to pay you back. Yeah. Uh, Ken, that's, that's <laughs> sadly the uh, beginning of failure in our, in our industry. Yes. And it's been recorded and played out many, many times over. If you spend your deposits before your client comes out, ultimately you're going to fail. I don't know how you... Yeah, of course. You know that. I know that. Um, I think in a lot of instances, some of the outfitters and, you know, PHs that decide to become an outfitter themselves... They've never had a, an education in finance. They don't get it. You know, they think what's theirs is theirs to spend. Mm. And, you know, it, it can be the kiss of death. And I think we've got a lot of people that, again, I'm not going to say a lot, but certainly some, 
Um, so that may not be the case with you, but I'm sure, I know it's not the case with you, but I think there's been a lot of people that have rolled in. So, so but your experience has been that right now that people are, are really booking for shorter periods yes. of time. Yeah, they're not booking so quite as far out. Um, the show here has been a great indication. Um, it's been brisk. Business has been fantastic, but 90% has been for 2022. I, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. I mean, look, from I'm happy with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I have, obviously, hell of a lot happier than 2020. Sure, yeah. But um, challenging, too, I think, because it, I think it probably does give a lot of people a, a less than secure future. It does. You're quite right. You know, yeah. um, you know especially if you if a company your size, you know, you've got bank accounts, you've got personnel, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the smaller ones may be a little bit less challenging. But what's your sense that the safari business is like right now? Is it is it picking up? Is it good? Is it as strong as it used to? Is it declined? Actually, I've got another question that I'll ask in a minute. Okay. Ken, my feeling is... is um is from the bookings we've taken of late, um, the Americans in particular are ready to travel. They're tired of being boxed up and um, very positive. So I think we're in an upbeat market now. Uh, the two years where travel was somewhat limited, I think has only fueled the thirst for wanting to go back on safari. So yes, I'm very positive about, about it now in the future. And we certainly feeling feeling and seeing that in our bookings, we do a reasonable amount of business out of Europe, about thirty percent, and they are still quite a way behind. Very cautious, don't quite know if they'll be able to. A lot of them are travel. still locked up. That's exactly it. Quite hard to plan for yeah. for freedom when you're still in jail, you know. Right, so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, uh, and I had a conversation with somebody yesterday about this, that I look at Africa and the pleasure of going there, the, but if you just look at the cost of a plains game animals in Africa versus North America, in my opinion, the smart hunter will fly to Africa all the time because you can get damn cheap fares now, and uh, an elk, for instance, is $8,000, $9,000, $10,000. I can get an eland, a kudu, uh, a comparable size animal for $1,000 or $1,500. Sorry about that. Ken, you're quite right. Um, I've been watching the game prices in Texas with great interest not just the Native American species, but also the exotics that are here. Right. Uh, I mean, some of the prices are tenfold what they are in Africa, right. at least. Um, so why aren't there more people going to Africa? I think it's... It's a freaking passport and an airplane. I think it's a bit of the unknown, you know. Uh, air travel is a bit scary at the moment with COVID and all the rest. I, d I had 120,000 miles of air travel in 2021. Well done. I think that's great. You know, they, I'm a, I'm a, what's called a, a concierge key member of American Airlines. So that's an invitation only. And I had them phone me, I guess about a month ago, and say, Mr. Darcy, it's, you know, we're really grateful for your business. You're one of the few concierge members that has continued putting so many miles on. I don't know what why people are so concerned, but no, me neither. I've, I've flown flat out yeah. all the way through, so. Yeah. But I, but I really, I'm, I'm, I've always wondered, why don't people go to Africa? I, I can go there for so much less, you know, than I can going on a. Hunt we here. need you as our spokesman, kid. Well, I can do that pretty easily. You know, everything you. comes with a price. <laughs> 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 you know, it's as simple as that. Um, I really don't know, uh, you know. So I guess one of the last question that I have, Mark, is any great advice for for new clients coming over? Um, what well, if somebody somebody called and said, "Look, I'd like to go for a hunt in Africa for the first time." What are you kind of suggesting? 
are you giving them any advice? Learn how to shoot really well before you come. What do you give them? What kind of advice might you give them? Okay, I think um, start off with do your homework. It's half the fun of your hunt is going through the homework. Check out a few. Don't book with the first person you you come across. If you can get a good referral from somebody who's physically been there, even better. Check out the references. Make sure they're members of a wonderful organization like DSC and that they've been around for a while. They've been around the block. Um, but uh, let me, sorry for interrupting, but the worst hunt I've ever been on in my life was booked through an agent that's been a member of DSC forever. Fallon and I and Larry Wyshoon went to hunt in Kyrgyzstan. So I think you have to dig deeper than uh, just... I've heard about that hunt, yes. Yes, it was I'm a terrible sure you one. have. I have. Yeah, I think to doing your your you know extensive homework is is good. Um, there are there are pros and cons booking through a booking agent or booking direct with their outfitter. I think it just depends um, what referrals you've got, and ask all the right questions. You know, uh, how do you hunt? What what size areas are we hunting right. in? Are they fenced? Uh, are they not fenced? Free range, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that research is is very, very important. When it comes to the preparation for going on safari, I cannot begin to tell you how important it is to get some formal training. You know, I've been a professional hunter now for 38 years, and I'll give you an example. I went to Fallon's safari uh, uh, school, shooting school, thinking, well, I pretty much know how to do this, you know, I've survived. Man, was I wrong? You know, the learning curve was steep, and I and I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, was was that your that wasn't your first trip to no, France when you no, and I met? I went no. many years ago when right. Tim started his his safari uh, shooting school, right. um, and I've become a, um, a a good supporter of it. I like to encourage my guys to go on it. If you wound, you know, uh, a major animal on your safari you pretty much paid for that school 10 times over. But on top of it, it's not just the cost, it's the whole ethics and the feel yep. good. No, no true sportsman likes to wound it even. There's nothing worse than going to sleep Unless at night. Unless it's a hog in Texas. That, that might be the exception or a crocodile. But, oh, okay, I don't know that. <laughs> but uh, you know, no one wants to go to bed at night knowing that I've got a sable out there that's gut shot and I might never find it. No, the sad thing though is it's happened to all of us. It has. It and it's and it's a terrible, terrible feeling. No, it is. It is indeed. So that 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 preparation is great, yeah. um, and I think the, the the most important thing is even if you book through an agent, is have some direct interaction with your with your outfitter and your PH. Um, you know the story when your first hunt, you took two huge duffel bags, and used three items of clothing out yeah. of it. You know, so as you go on, you simplify your life, and often that's better. Um, uh, the old days, my, my biggest fear was always when a client arrived and he pulled out a brand new Weatherby 460 that had never been zeroed and still didn't have the scope on yet. Then I knew I had problems on my hand. hands. When I got an old boy come out and he brought out his old 30 odd six with dents on it, hardly any bluing on the barrel, I knew I was in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, I, I think one of the things is... Um, you know, if I come if I come to hunt with you, well, though we've met and we've known each other for a while, but had we not, I would make every effort to spend some time talking to you yes. on the phone. If if in person, great, but certainly on the phone because we're going to spend seven days or ten days together. Absolutely. And I really don't want to find that you're an asshole after I get there. Yeah. You and know, and so. you know, Ken, sometimes the just personalities that just don't exactly. mesh. Doesn't mean either one is good or nope. bad, but if you have a good chat, you know. I had a guy in the booth yesterday, um, must have been a great guy, but I knew within five minutes that there's no ways I could have a good hunt with him. Exactly. And he knew the same too. Yeah. And we actually chuckled about it, you know. And you've hit the nail on the head. Yeah, it's really important. If we're, if we're going to spend time hunting uh, together, we have to be able to get along because Absolutely. it just makes it a, a pleasurable hunt. Yeah, the camaraderie of the hunt yeah. and actually enjoying it is what makes it all. Exactly. I yeah. mean, even even if you don't get anything, which is in Africa highly unlikely, 
But if you go on a hunt here, um, you know, you go for elk hunting here and just not get an elk, or Fallon and I did in Kriegetstan, our, our disastrous hunt, you know, a couple of days after, after we all got over our food poisoning and things like that, <laughs> we chuckled about it a little bit. But, you know, we were with some pretty good friends, and, and over and after it all was said and done, it was a terrible hunt, but we were with some pretty good friends, so it wasn't so bad. That helped. That helped. Yeah. Mark, it's great to see you. I appreciate your time. Uh, I've got to reach out to you because I know that you owe me a hunt. That's exactly right, <laughs> kid. I mean, hell, I've got a whole lot of Remingtons there. They're just waiting for you. Exactly. <laughs> I don't even have to bring my own gun. You don't? You don't? Oh, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.